uh, YK and, and Marcus, uh, thanks for your time and uh, welcome to the Metal Express uh, Rockumentary series. Uh, we'll have a quick trip down uh, memory lane. Uh, let's go back to the very beginning. Um, in in 1980, 82, uh, you played in, in two different bands. Uh, Marcus, you, you played with uh, Kai Hansen and, and Ingo already then in, in uh, yeah, Second Hell. That was called Second Hell, and before that they were they were called like Catherine's Wheel, and then they were called like Iron Fist, and you know we had many names. Each second gig we had a different name, and even on stage suddenly Kai said, "All right, we're we're the rock band Bomber," and then we were called Bomber, and I said, "All right, are we? We have many names, you know. Why not? Why not Bomber?" I don't know, whenever there was a Motorhead album coming out, we had a new name, kind <laughs> of, you know. <laughs> and uh, YK, your band was uh, Powerful. Yeah, and well, eventually uh, we we joined uh, with Kai Hansen or whatever, you know, because keyboarders of that time, they rather wanted to play jazz or funk rock or what do I know. And then what we wanted to do... Uh, was not so much uh, to the liking of the remaining band members, they were simply not professional enough. Just like weekend musicians or whatever, and I was really sick of that. We wanted to do something, everybody of the guys we met in Hamburg, like for instance Marcus or whatever, you know, were kind of uh, very concerned about, well, actually doing music for professional or for uh, whatever job. No? And the others, you know, merely just wanted to have fun or whatever, or had other things in mind, like they get offered a contract of $600,000 uh, just for being the one they are. <laughs> no? And that naturally doesn't work. And so in the beginning, when we got together, we, uh, we rehearsed a lot, almost every day, and then, I, I don't know, five up to seven hours. Nobody can take that away from us. No? Okay. It was just like very heavy and whatever. I don't know how we did it, but it was because it was new and, and fresh and it was because everybody wanted to do it and everybody felt it was necessary. Then later on, you cannot go on working like that because you want your private life and you can't possibly always do this as intense as you did in the beginning. In the beginning you have a lot more incense and whatever, but then you also learn the things mm. that you have to have and going and and make. Sure. Yeah, so it was a long time of rehearsal say a year or whatever or one and a half years we rehearsed almost every day and whatever it was you know, whether it was good or not so good but then when we got the record contract we obviously felt like uh, playing something more intense or complicated or whatever before you didn't really know what for. Yeah, but then you ju just also don't know how to do things. You know, in the studio I was like sitting with my bass guitar right next to my cabinet and in right in the middle of the recording room with a head f f set on yeah, and too. playing, you know. Because I we thought, thought it was thought wimpy thought not to do I so. I thought it's professional, you know, and, and then you have to sit there, there's a headphone, so you're going to use it, you know. Mm. <laughs> it wasn't a live session, but it was like, you know, overdubbing in the recording room right next oh, to your cabinet. Yeah. But then it was like you thought it's just the way th they do it, you know. Mm. Nowadays we're sitting in, yeah, we're sitting in like the monitor and controlling room and play it easy. Actually, because you you kill your head, you kill your brain that way. You know, there's there's no way of doing it in front of the cabinet all the time. But but in the <coughs> beginning we thought it was uncool and wimpy <coughs> to sit in the in the control room no? yeah, because yeah. we heard about people who did so and we said, ah, oh, they're fucking wimps. You yeah. know? <laughs> when we did like the very first tour, it was like a guy coming into the dressing room telling us what time we are supposed to be on stage, you know. Um, it's, it's been a guy we've never saw, seen before in our lifetime, so we, we said, what, what kind of an asshole is trying to tell us what to do, you know? And was a tour manager. <laughs> oh, <laughs> all right, all right then. Oh, he was a nice guy, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. yeah, after but all. we didn't know. <laughs> I'm not a power 
uh, the, the first recording with you that, that was uh, released was on this uh, death metal compilation. You did uh, two tracks, Metal the Invaders and Earth for Life. Uh, and I guess that brought you a record contract later. Uh, how, how, how come you, you, um, you recorded for that compilation? Was that, was that a contest was you won? It was actually an accident because there was supposed to be another band on that sampler. Uh, and so they could, they wouldn't play because the singer had something different to do or one of them had to go to the army or had an accident, I don't know. So there was one band, there was one free space and they needed to fill it up. So, you know, at this time somebody just called us and thought it might be a cool idea to have us on it. <laughs> noise records by the time yeah. did those samplers to find out which band would uh, would get the better yeah. reviews uh, because they only did so because they wanted to find out which is the strongest band because they couldn't decide for themselves or they didn't want to they said whatever like if for instance that band Dark Avenger you know mm -hmm. would have made the people crazy you know they would have given Dark Avenger another contract right sure mm. Uh, you released uh, Metal Invaders uh, later as well. Is that the same version, or did no. you? No, it's, it's a different totally recording. Recorded, actually, is, it is very close, though. But then, I mean, that's the way we played by that time. No? Yes. <laughs> yeah, but but then still, the second version is is kind of it, it, it's on the mini album. No, it's on the Walls of Jericho, is it? So anyway, yeah. listen back to it. Now it sounds strange, and we recorded it be because we thought it sounds weird on that death metal sampler. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, after all those years, yeah. um, we got totally different ears. <laughs> of course, your style uh, would evolve even more, but you had your own style already then. I mean, you, you played ultra fast, and uh, you were uh, different. But who were your influences? back then uh, basically we only wanted to be more uh, extreme than for instance except or rainbow or deep purple that was my aim I know that that uh, <coughs> Kai Hansen had a different aim because he knew so many heavy metal bands and <coughs> Holocaust and whatever you know he was a real metal head who knew all those bands and, and I've been new to that thing because I basically have only been a hard rock musician and I didn't know Man of War or whatever when we came to that uh, sounds club there were so many heavy metal bands that I had to get to know like Twisted Sister and whatever they were all new by that time mm -hmm. and uh, well basically we just wanted to impress people the idea was uh, when they leave a concert of ours they have to keep the melodies in their heads whether they want or they don't want no? But but still doing all that, you know, fast kind of double bass and speed thing going on, you know. Just mm. keep it keep the melody on the top of it, but then still trying to impress the people with the back with the with the backing kind of tracking we did. <laughs> Sure. Uh, well, after um, well, the Halloween uh, album was of uh, Jericho and also uh, the Judas uh, EP. Um, Kai stopped singing. Uh, was that uh, his own decision, or did you <laughs> make him stop singing? Well, it had to do so. It had to be like this because there was so much to do with it, with all this guitar stuff. Well, he's doing it now again, you know. But early in those early days, he was kind of, you know doing both and felt like it's pretty pretty much stress to well, do we both, also criticized you know? him a lot yeah, yes, no? of course we, co we couldn't do <coughs> things we had in our mind because he was singing and playing like this riff or that solo bit or that line or the guitar so it, we we felt it was a little bit limited with uh, him doing both and he, he of course agreed then
Um, so, uh, before you uh, recorded, uh, well, your first milestone, uh, Keeper of the Seven Keys Part 1, uh, Michael Kiske uh, appeared in the band. Uh, where did you find him? I mean, he was a, a youngster with a great voice. Yeah, it was strange. Marcus got to know uh, him a bit earlier via a friend or whatever. Yeah, yeah, he huh? told me there's a, that there's a great band in one of those schools playing in one of those schools, the venues rehearsing down there, and he told me to go there, and I just, you know, had the number of him and gave him my number, you know, and gave him the numbers, and but he wouldn't call me back, so I, I liked him, seeing him with that band. He knew I was from Halloween, and so he actually didn't know Halloween so well. He thought it was just thrash and stuff he wouldn't like, so he wouldn't call me back. I, I Somehow I gave the number to... No, at, the, Michael, at the same time I had a working colleague right. and she gave me his number oh, okay. yet okay. again and because she knew answer. him personally and whatever and, and so I called him. And so suddenly he would answer. I couldn't talk too much to him about what we are really doing because there was all his band colleagues around him and I told him, you know, this is the number and I couldn't. I didn't have the chance to talk like, wow, wow, blah, the band is doing this and we like to do this because there were all his colleagues around, you know, his band members at this time and I wouldn't do so cruel to you know so he actually talked to him well he obviously was the best singer in hamburg yeah. or at that age or whatever or with those interests or whatever there were many other singers that that wouldn't fit halloween actually we we tried uh, three or four people even americans mm -hmm. and there was one american over there who had a strange perception of uh, how to make money in germany mm -hmm. <laughs> it was really funny i mean he had a phone bill like like fuck and <laughs> he thought he can go to the um, he can go to the uh, what is it called casino in hamburg and and win a lot of money because that's what he was used to from his hometown in america <laughs> and he would always go to the casino and come back with a lot of money. And in Hamburg, he went there, you know, <laughs> and he lost everything because he thought, oh yeah, like uh, he also said, like, wow, you have water toilets, you have fridges, <laughs> and uh, it seems like he had kind of a distorted uh, uh, idea of what Germany was by that time. <laughs> yeah. um, this kind of started a new era for for the band. This was a very successful album. Um, and uh, the music took a different turn. I mean, another trademark for, for Halloween was born with uh, the, the vocal melodies and stuff. Uh, was that due to um, Michael Kiske joining the band or had you started writing uh, different kinds of, of music? I think it's a process if you have a good singer, if you have a new singer and he was like, he convinced him to be in the band. As I said before, he thought Halloween might be a bunch of drunken trashes only doing and then he heard what we were able to do in the in, in the rehearsal room and stuff like this and from the records we, from the recordings we already did and then he was quite satisfied with what we are doing and putting himself more and more into it getting those melodies ideas and then we we were, we were actually able for the first time to write stuff that comes a bit more massive you know because the vocals and the guitars are now suddenly independent gives you a much wider range to work, you know. Actually, he had his own band he was very proud of yeah. and he didn't want to leave that band. Really? Yeah. But he was forced to do that eventually. Well, I think we had more spirit and more magic and whatever than his band. Mm. And also, if you if you take a look into personal problems or whatever, or characters, you know, we were simply the stronger guys, so to say. You, you, I mean, we didn't see it that way by that time, but we couldn't understand why somebody would not want to work with us. Okay. <laughs> yes, yeah, right, I agree, <laughs> I agree then. <laughs> <laughs> um, you also uh, shot a video for for the track uh, Halloween. Uh, what do you recall from from sh shooting that music video? Well, it was a yeah, shit, right. shit cold <laughs> night somewhere in the forest, and it was the guy who did the Bon Jovi video, like "You Give Love a Bad Name" or what it was. And I forgot the name of the producer. And it was shit cold, and the setup was so so. And we froze our asses off and it was terrible. <laughs> and I'd rather have it done somewhere else. It was the typical kind of low budget video where actors got paid, I don't know, 100 marks or 200 marks a night. There were 78 year old people there in the, in the extra actors section or whatever. And 
Yeah, well, uh, we, we didn't get anything for it, but what we heard, like, when the team got back to the Hilton Hotel, you know, they, they, uh, they took most of what was needed for the video production costs, you know, that evening as a, as a buffet, and they had some girls, or whatever <laughs> it was, no? So they, they sure know how to party. <laughs> actually wanted to release uh, a double album instead of Keep It All The Same Kiss w yeah, part yeah. one and two. Uh, did you record both albums at no, the same no, time? No, we didn't. We were pretty bold and arrogant to come up with the idea to do a double album, but you could have done it. You could have. It's just like the question how it would have sounded. Yeah. Or how much work it would have been. Would have been possible that everybody would have gone insane in the process of doing so. Yeah, yeah. And so for, for the Keep It One we had an, an amount of time and we had the same amount of time for the keeper too so that was uh, mm. now to see it from now from today it was really good to do it like this yeah and also by that time we had illusions about ways of recording and producing uh, that uh, were taken away by by tommy newton and tommy hansen the productors team 
who had a fixed idea of how to do productions. And be before it was merely like record some drums and play something. Yeah. And that was that. No? And so they, they actually put a more professional aspect to everything because they wanted to produce like Def Leppard. And that's taking you a lot longer. No? Uh, well, uh, Keeper of the Seven Keys Part 2 was another uh, successful album. Uh, and then Kai left the band. Uh, was that uh, a surprise for you? Somehow it was because we had all this success together and I wouldn't believe, uh, I was like believing in that kind of thing, you know, being naive. You start something and then you go through it till the end, but this wouldn't happen, you know. This is never happens but so he decided to do something different oh, we well we, he was telling us before then he's doing the tour and then he likes to do something different on its own because it was like too much touring and too much away from this and he would like to do something different and then we well, I, can, I can understand him on, on yeah, that yeah. point of view on the other hand we also had uh, different opinions about certain things no? like um, by the time I said we got to be more original and he said no we can we can take parts of whatever because nobody will find out about it or whatever and, and to me that was like a strange thing you know we, we had a lot of trouble because of that and I mean uh, he asked me not to mention that and so I didn't mention it it's just that you know we had a lot of trouble because of that so otherwise if uh, we would have sat together and, and, and done more of our own things uh, we wouldn't have had that trouble. And there were uh, like other things that went into the personal uh, field, you know, that we were attacking each other about personal things. And so that's basically stupid, mm. but we've done it. No? And so somebody starts it and the other one answers and then you just got to defend yourself against the other only because of childish shit. No? And you know, you know better different and uh, uh, more uh, grown up afterwards, but by that time, you know, everybody thought he alone was uh, responsible for the success. We had Michael Kiske thought he was, I thought I was, Marcus thought he was, <laughs> and uh, naturally, well, Ingo and Kai, they thought they were only responsible for the big success.
and then Rowan Grappo uh, joined the band and in uh, 91 you released Pink Bubbles Go Ape and um, well uh, that was a different album uh, fr from the previous ones and uh, I know a lot of critics didn't like that album a lot and a few of your fans too. Uh, well what happened musically on that album? It, it's been, I think it's been rehearsed to death because it's it's been written and it's been done and it's been composed already and it was like arranged it was actually ready to be recorded and then we had all this noise record court case you remember that it took us like three years or something and then in the end of the day after like one year we weren't allowed to do any promotional you know uh, activities with the name Halloween at all so that meant we, we wouldn't be allowed to even record stuff to go with the name Halloween into the studio and record some stuff, you know, and until the case is like closed or clear or something. And so we kept on rehearsing and so they told us, well, you're going to be in the studio in the next two months, uh, so keep on rehearsing. And so we kind of rehearsed it over and over again and then pff, more f for more than one and a half years or something. I can't. Actually, I had a few songs I wanted to do that we didn't rehearse. And uh, then finally we got to the studio and found out that uh, Chris Sangeridis is a different kind of producer. He works with bands who know what they want to do. Mm. Yeah, and the stuff was, I didn't rehearse my tracks with the band because I was thinking that we would do things like with Tommy Hansen. Tommy Hansen goes and sits down with the bands and does uh, recomposition, arrangement and whatever. He's optimizing things and he's doing things a bit like Matt Lang. And, uh, well, you know, Chris Singer, we just didn't do that. And so we were there with a few over-rehearsed tracks, which could easily be recorded. And, you know, he couldn't help me or, or the band, you know, in, in trying to come up with anything else that I would have liked to have done. So basically, you could only take the stupid heavy metal hamsters or the number one and do it. And this wasn't enough. Huh? Not for a Halloween record by that time. Actually, the result is quite good, but I fell into a big hole yeah. and I had a big surprise. It's no. actually not, not not what you expect after the Keeper 2 or something, but then it has happened like this. And even in the studio, because of that situation, we were we had lo lots of arguments and stuff like this already starting, you know, and about how we do this music and how we going to do this record. And then there was like the producer in the middle trying to figure out what's going on, push it in this or that direction. And then there was like... You know, it was it was weird. Even recording it was weird. Like. Basically, it was all wrong, except for the things we had rehearsed. <laughs> <laughs> So as far as I understand, the uh, 
the relationship between uh, the guys in the band weren't too good at this moment. And and the next uh, album, uh, Chameleon, was released in in '93, two years after, was also a very different uh, Halloween album, uh, kind of mellow. Yeah, it was kind of four uh, solo records in one. <laughs> yeah, so everybody had kind of like four tracks, and that was it. And there was no discussion. It was okay because um, no discussion was wanted because everybody was so fixed on his musical kind of field that no one would have allowed uh, criticism from the other side. Uh, so I couldn't have gone to Michael Kiske and say, you know, this chord is shit, please change it. Uh, as well as he couldn't come and, and say like, you know, I don't like your melody on Giants here, you know, I want to sing it different. I would have killed him. <laughs> you know, so and that's been the situation. So we actually kind of survived by shutting up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I saw you on that tour, and uh, I could see on stage that you weren't friends. W was that a hard tour for you, or was it just that gig here in Oslo? No, it was a nightmare. Mm. Yeah, it was strange. At this time, was strange. The bubbles and and the chameleon was strange, kind of thing going on with that music with, with that records and 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 the way we toured the, the way we set together the life set list and stuff it was, it was, was kind of really really strange yeah. and i still remember this gig here very vividly and i mean <laughs> each time i return here i switch to a uh, safe and uh, kind and and calm mode you know i found out that each time we came here some kind of aggression took place so there's something about this place for people who don't know about it who come here for the first time they fall into a big hole of aggression <laughs> here in the rockefeller uh, so each time there was something different going on and i just decided after the first show uh, I spent here that that whenever I come back here I will keep peace and calm and not get uh, aggravated or whatever. He, he knows it too. <laughs> <laughs> After that album, uh, Ingo uh, left the band, or, or was he fired? I know he had no, some drug problems. He was in a state of, you know, where you couldn't get him out on tour and play proper. And, you know, after all this we went through, you have to be actually kind of stable. And you had to, to think about what's the next step, you know. You need, like, absolutely strong, healthy people to... For the, for the band, we needed actually strong people to for the band to carry on, and he was like, he had, he became that schizophrenia kind of thing, you know, like two souls were living in him, and he was like, it wasn't that he felt it, it was like he was actually living, you know, he was like hearing voices, and we 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 got him to rehabilitation like t twice. 
And then we took them to Japan, and it wasn't to happen anymore. You know, we we had to we had to say, all right, it's not going to work like this. What are you going to do after he was to rehabilitation? You know, it, it's just it was just it's, it was just not happened. We couldn't just work with him. Kai tried to to record some stuff with him, and it and he wouldn't really he wouldn't really you know get clear in his mind. Really, really heavy. Like it, it's been a really, really heavy sickness. Maybe also, also, uh, also record from maybe taking drugs or drinking too much and stuff like this. You know, you open something in your mind. You open doors that you well, better should, yeah, better shouldn't shouldn't have opened. You know, because it's not easy to close them if you, if you're able to close them anyway. And he was just like in that state of you know weird you know you couldn't really tour and work with him anymore yeah, on the other hand he wanted to continue yeah. because oh, he yeah. was too proud for it you know mm -hmm. and so I had to sit with him six hours and say no Ingo you can't go on no no you know nobody had the power left to do that anyways and so we had that meeting about this well and he very angrily left uh, the place no? he slammed the door because he wouldn't see well the facts and also he didn't want to admit to himself that well he was in a very bad state so he also didn't accept the advice of the doctors or whatever he didn't believe them because they wore glasses you know and, and they were like oh sorry and they were like I don't know they were educated yeah, people and he didn't like, like he didn't trust he, he educated saw him, people he saw them people enemies. like enemies yeah so he was like you know they are not like him. They, he wouldn't trust those people to really help him. Uh, well, uh, Michael Kiske also left after that album. I guess he w he was fired. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he wanted to do a totally different thing. After the chameleon, we we thought it's time to go a little bit back to where we actually came from, do some more metal stuff, and and we wanted to rock and go out there and show that we still can do it, and you know, forget those times with that. Last album and so on, and he wouldn't think so. He thought it might be cool to go even further, and that uh, to go a step even more further in that direction. You know, he he was playing songs to us. There weren't hardly any guitars to hear. You know, and he was on that Beatles kind of thing. And he, well, his music and his taste of music and what he wanted to do was totally different from what we thought might be cool to do for the next record you know and so we just couldn't really it wasn't about his voice it was never about his voice or something always fine you know but it was just like un impossible to we felt it's impossible impossible to do what he wanted us to do yeah, we also had too many discussions yeah and also uh, the relationship was more in between an Elvis and his backup band and I never wanted to be a backup band you know? it's just I'm too proud for that and then it's like this you know you you had things to do with talented people like Kai Hansen you know good songwriters and everything and then you have to bear with the ideas that Michael Kiske came up with you know and it would have been better for him to just shut up and sing and <laughs> not write songs you know actually
Well, then yet uh, another era for the band started and things started to uh, go the right way again. Uh, and the Darius uh, joined the band and also Uli Kush. Uh, and you released well, Master of the Rings in '94, then Time of the Oath, and, and Better Than the Raw. Uh, three good, uh, good albums. And uh, I guess those were happy days for for the band again. Yeah, because we we've been too close. We've been pretty close to what was happened uh, at this time, and we've been too close to what we were doing actually. And we sometimes you don't see things. Somebody from the outside is coming in and actually showing you what you are supposed to do, what you are what you are supposed to sound like, and stuff like this. Because he has it had a much had a very good idea about what Halloween was and what Halloween can be with with him. You know, that was good. I guess. And uh, The Dark Ride in, in 2000 it was, well, yet uh, a bit different album, a, a bit darker and uh, as far as I, I remember there were some problems within the band uh, again. Yeah, yeah, well, it's not never been easy. We had very good times and then the sad times and we have discussions about music, a lot of songwriters, a lot of trouble, you know, sometimes. And this was, to, to me, The Dark Ride was an example for like, Every time you do a record, there's managers and record companies telling you what to do. We wouldn't let this happen, but then they're going on your nerves anyway, you know. And for my part, I was saying, all right, let's just for once let them do what they think and see what happens, see what comes out of it, you know, if they have more influence. Uh, like I into the idea for a little bit of time. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then I thought, let's see what happened, because they had an eye on the American market and what was coming out of it, you know. There wasn't even an American... A lousy American record deal for us in that dark ride period, of t you know, and so it was absolutely blown off. Then a few more lineup uh, changes. Uh, Roland left the band. I you can tell you why. It was because they were strong uh, um, supporters of the idea of changing the music. Because they had no Halloween identity. You know, they've they've done it as a job. And to a certain point, you know, they they always had the hope, you know, that maybe it would pay out or whatever. In fact, it did pay out when everybody of us got uh, paid uh, a lot of money because of this high life thing we've done in the time of the oath before. And I think after the Better Than Raw, uh, they didn't believe in the whole Halloween concept anymore. No? And I, I, I mean, for me, it was very easy uh, and very, very important, not easy, very important to remove those people. Otherwise, it would have gone on. We would have had clashes because they were not convinced of the Halloween music. So uh, it seems that by that time, I was the only guy remaining who was interested in doing Halloween music. No? So minds change and whatever, you know, but it's not that they left the band. Like, it's always easy to later on say in an interview, ah, I wanted to leave anyways, you know. How many people do you know who say so? Paul McCartney always wanted to leave the Beatles, yes. <laughs> 
After that, you released Rabbit Don't Come Easy. Then your current album, uh, Keeper of the Seven Keys, The Legacy, uh, was released. The first idea was this, was Michael, like, was making a joke because he felt uh, really comfortable with the lineup we had together. So he said, well, this lineup I could easily uh, imagine doing a Keeper Part 3 or something. Yeah. You also, know. it was because we had a record company, uh, 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 employees you know that said would you do a keeper record and then then Andy said yeah why not huh? and then I said uh, I mean with this lineup I could imagine doing it so that's how mm -hmm. uh, so it's like uh, it's been claimed the the idea was uh, of uh, I don't know of Marcus of no, well Andy then, then Andy catch was catching it and then we slept for a couple of days and then that subject came came up more and more oft, often and so it was also mentioned on message boards yeah and so, so huh? once then we just decided to do so just giving it a try you know it was one record company representative who wanted to do a joke a half serious joke but it was only because he had liked the the, the rabbit tour and and the concerts we have done in Japan so much you know, that, that he said like hey you know come on do a keeper record and so then we said, yeah, okay. let's try. No?